good morning everyone what a, what a beautiful sunny morning it is today and today we are going to be meeting the Hanoverians uh, we've already met the Tudor kings and queens we've already met the Stuart kings and queens and it is now the turn of the Hanoverian dynasty uh, and without further ado I will set up my share screen and we will begin our introduction to the Hanoverian kings and queens. We'll start from the beginning. Always a good place to begin, I believe. I will, as usual, pick up my little laser pointer because there's a few little details we'll be looking at during the course of our talk today. Wonderful. So we are going to be meeting the Hanoverians, a series of kings and queens who ruled Britain from George I through to Queen Victoria. Now, Queen Victoria, as you know, had a, a very long reign in her own right. So we're just going to be touching at the end of our talk on Queen Victoria's arrival on the throne and her links to the Hanoverian family and how she inherited the throne as a member of that family. The Hanoverians ruled Britain from 1714 to 1901, the end of Queen Victoria's reign. And during the time that they were ruling Britain, there were a number of Georges, William and Victoria. They're all members of the same family and across the dynasty we have one generation starting with George the first, George the third, second, the second generation. Uh, we then skip a generation, we'll find out about that later. We then have our fourth generation so to speak uh, we then have a fifth generation with two brothers ruling before we go to Victoria, our sixth generation of the family. And during this time, the Hanoverian period, often also known as the Georgian period in British history, it was a time when on the Indian-Pakistani border, the Sikh Confederacy was being established. We also have during this time the reign of Catherine the Great as Tsar of Russia. It's also a period of history when in France we have the French Revolution, followed shortly afterwards by the Haitian Revolution. In Africa we have the establishment of the largest kingdom in South Africa, the Zulu Kingdom. And then as we get towards the end of our Hanoverian period, in South America, South American countries such as Chile in 1818 and later Mexico and Peru uh, declare independence, having previously been part of the Spanish Empire on that continent. And we begin with a lady who never actually became queen. The last Stuart Queen, Queen Anne, died in 1714 and when she died the rule of the Stuart dynasties came to an end. Anne had no surviving children so the lady we see here on screen, Sophia, Electress of Hanover in Germany, Anne's distant cousin and a granddaughter of the Stuart King James I was declared heir to the throne by an act of parliament in 1701. Sophia's mother, Elizabeth, was the eldest daughter of James I and sister of Charles I. However, Sophia, as we see her here in her later years as Electress of Hanover, died on the 8th of June 1714 before Anne who died on the 1st of August of the same year. So Sophia 
was heir to the throne, never actually succeeded to the throne, and it was her son, Prince George of Hanover, who was crowned King George, the first monarch of the House of Hanover. And here we see George himself, known to us today, of course, as George I, because of the subsequent Georges. He reigned from 1714 to 1727. And we see him with his eldest son, the future George II, and George II's wife, Caroline. And we can see to the right a map of modern Germany, which shows the site of the city of Hanover, which was where the Hanoverians were based. Now, when George inherited the throne in 1714, he and his wife, Sevilla, had two children. And when George died, he was succeeded by his son, George II. George I mainly lived in Great Britain after 1714, although he visited his home in Hanover in 1716, 1719, 1720, 1723, and again in 1725. In fact, in total, George spent about 20% of his reign in Germany. The city of Hanover was the capital city of the electorate of Hanover, which existed as a political entity from 1692 to 1814, and then became the Kingdom of Hanover from 1814 to 1866. The wider region of Hanover in northwest Germany comprises most of the modern German state of Lower Saxony, which you can see marked here on this modern day map. In 1837, the personal union of the United Kingdom and Hanover ended because George the fourth's heir in the United Kingdom was female, Queen Victoria. Since Hanover could only be inherited by male heirs, it passed to George the fourth's brother, Ernest Augustus, and remained a kingdom until 1866, when it was annexed by Prussia during the Austro-Prussian Wars. So for the majority of the Georgian period, the kings of Hanover, uh, well, the electors of Hanover, were also the kings and queens of the United Kingdom. George I, who arrived as king in the United Kingdom as an adult, depended on his ministers to help him rule. The ministers held regular cabinet meetings, which developed from the earlier Privy Council meetings between the monarch and the leading nobles and office holders in the kingdom. Both George I and the II made use of this system as both spoke English as an additional language, were unfamiliar with British politics, and thus relied heavily on this selected group of advisers. The term minister came into being since these royal officers ministered to the monarch. And when Robert Walpole took over as leader of the cabinet, he became the first Prime Minister. And we see here to the left Robert Warpole addressing one of the King's cabinets. Now, opposition to the Hanoverian rule was led by the Jacobites. Although Queen Anne was the last reigning Stuart monarch, her father, James II, had been deposed from the throne by her sister Mary and her brother-in-law William III and the Jacobites 
largely a 17th and 18th century movement supported the restoration of the House of Stuart to the British throne for the male descendants of the deposed Stuart King James II. The name of the movement, the Jacobites, is derived from Jacobus, the Latin version of James. And during the reign of the first three Hanoverian kings, the British Jacobites supported attempts by both James Edward Stuart, who we see here, the old pretender, son of James II, and Charles Edward Stuart, known as the Young Pretender or Bonnie Prince Charlie, James II's grandson, to claim the British throne. Both these Stuart Pretenders lived in exile on the continent and despite a number of military interventions were never, never able to return the throne to the Stuart dynasty. Jacobite supporters, when offering a toast to the king, would pass their wine glass over a glass of water, thus literally toasting the king over the water. The Stuart claimants living over the channel in France. George II, who succeeded his father to the throne in 1727, is the most British, most recent British monarch born outside Great Britain. He was born and brought up in northern Germany before his father, George I, ascended the British throne. During the War of Austrian Succession, succession George participated in the ba Battle of Dedinger in 1743, and he thus also became the last British monarch to lead an army in battle. Like his father, George II faced claims by James II's son and grandson to, to the grandson to the throne to the throne until their cause was finally defeated at the Battle of Culloden in 1746. Uh, it was George II, who we see here to the left in this fine oil painting, which hangs at the British Museum, was the sovereign who gave the royal assent to the British Museum Act of 1753. And in 1757, he donated the old Royal Library to the museum. To show their gratitude, the museum's trustees commissioned a portrait from the artist John Shackleton, which today hangs in room two, one of the public galleries at the British Museum. Now, George played an honorific role in British politics and closely followed the advice of Walpole and other senior ministers who made the majority of decisions about policy. During his reign, the power of both his ministers and the Houses of Parliament grew. This view of the parade ground by horse guards in St James's Park shows spectators watching as George II made his way to the Houses of House of Lords in 1753. And just above it, you'll see I've popped in a modern photograph of the same scene, the area still looking very similar. We have here the parade ground where they have the trooping of the colour in front of horse guards. Uh, we have the modern Admiralty buildings down on the embankment and, of course, probably the most striking addition, the Millennium Wheel, which was raised in the year 2000, uh, still turning to this day. It was originally projected to be a five-year project, and I don't think anyone expected it to still be running over 20 years later. 
Now, George's reign saw increased production in coal mining, shipbuilding, and agriculture, together with a rapid rise in population. Overseas trade also grew following military interventions, which gave Britain control of parts of India and Canada. Now, on this slide, we see a portrait of Frederick, Prince of Wales, aged 29. And this was taken in 1736. It is drawn using black, red and white chalk on blue paper. And this is where we get to the first skip in the generations during the Hanoverian dynasty. Because George II's eldest son, Frederick, Prince of Wales, died in 1751, nine years before his father. So the crown eventually passed to George's grandson, Frederick's son, who reigned as George III. And we see here to the right a print showing the royal family. We have William, Duke of Cumberland in the centre, and behind him we have George II, his queen, who we saw earlier, Queen Caroline. We have Prince Frederick, Prince of Wales, the king that never was. And we have the Princess Anne, and her husband, the Prince of Orange, and then the younger female members of the royal family, the princesses Amelia and Caroline, Louisa and Mary. And Augustus, who was Frederick's wife, Princess of Wales, is shown in this oval frame at the side. And it was her son, who became the next king, George III. So you could also say that she was the queen that never was. She immediately, on the death of her father-in-law, became the queen mother when her son took the throne. George III reigned from 1790, so, sorry, 1769, to 1820. And we see here a print of the royal family taken in 1771. And above it, I've popped in the original oil painting on which the print is based. And then to the right, we have a porcelain figure of George III from the British Museum collection, which you can see is clearly modeled on the stance he has taken in the original oil painting. Now, George III succeeded to the throne at the age of 22, and he reigned for the next 59 years and 96 days. And only the Queen's Victoria and Elizabeth II have reigned longer. George was the first Hanoverian monarch to be born in England and to speak English as his first language. George I and II having both spoken German as their first language and indeed German continued as a family language down to Queen Victoria. George III never visited Hanover. He and his wife Charlotte, who we can see here seated in both versions of the portrait, had 15 children, nine sons and six daughters. And in 1762, George purchased Buckingham House on the site now occupied by Buckingham Palace for use as a family retreat for himself, his wife and the children. During the last 10 years of his reign, George became unwell, and his eldest son, 
later George IV, acted as Prince Regent and ruled the country on his father's behalf. Now, the porcelain figure of George III was produced around 1773 in Chelsea, London. And the Chelsea porcelain factory formed part of an early wave of British porcelain manufacturers, which sprung up after English porcelain was first showcased at the Royal Society in 1743. The Chelsea factory was based in Lawrence Street and staffed by craft workers of mostly French and Flemish origin, skilled in the use, manipulation and the firing of porcelain clay. The factory produced porcelain figures such as the one we have here on the screen, tea sets, clock cases, tableware, as well as novelty fruit and vegetable forms for use on the dining table. The oil painting, which we can see at the top, is in the Royal Collections, and it is by Joseph Zephner. It shows George III, Queen Charlotte, and their six eldest children. And it was painted in 1770. And the style of the portrait is deliberately old master. It is a homage to the portraits of Van Dyck and the royal family are shown in Van Dyck dress, a fashionable style popular for masquerades and portrait sitting during the reign of George III. A prints of the painting were widely circulated and quickly reproduced, as with this example, held by the British Museum. In addition to which, porcelain figures, which could be purchased for household use by the upper and middling classes, were also created based on the original oil painting as a way of disseminating the king's image through the kingdom and also showing loyalty to the Hanoverian king. In the portrait, Queen Charlotte holds Princess Sophia Augusta. At her side stands Princess Charlotte Matilda. On the left, we have George, the Prince of Wales, and his brother, Prince Frederick. In front, we have Prince William holding a bird and Prince Edward Augustus playing with a dog, still dressed as a toddler. And during this period of history, young boys and girls were dressed in a similar fashion. So you can see the baby on her mother's lap and also the toddler sitting with the dog are both wearing nowadays what we would call a girl's dress or skirt and it was not until they were older around the age of five or six that they would then start to wear breeches short trousers there's classical sculpture in the background and the coronet the crown with the orb and scepter to the right and the print we see below, based on the painting, was made by the printmaker Robert Sayer, who was based in Fleet Street, London. Now, George was a conscientious king. He read government papers and took an interest in government policy, although he had to listen to the views of his ministers before making final decisions about economic, religious and foreign policy. And one of the major events of his reign was the American Declaration of Independence from British rule in 1776. This established the United States of America as an independent country under its own president.
George the Third and Queen Charlotte are shown here with their surviving children. We saw some of them in the first portrait, and we also need to add in the princesses and princes Ernest, Elizabeth, Augustus, Adolphus, Octavius, Alfred, and Amelia. And Octavius and Alfred both died in infancy at the age of four and two, leaving the couple with 13 remaining children who survived to adulthood. George III was the first king to study science as part of his education, and he had his own astronomical observatory. He also took a keen interest in agriculture and was nicknamed Farmer George. George owned a huge collection of books, 65,000 of which were later given to the British Museum to start a national library, which now is the British Library up on the Euston Road. He also gave objects to the British Museum, including one of the first objects in the ancient Egyptian collection, the Rosetta Stone, which we see here at the top on the right. Now, the stone itself was discovered by the French in 1799, but had passed to the British under the Treaty of Alexandria in 1802, when a combined British and Turkish military force defeated the French army under Napoleon in Egypt. The Rosetta Stone was brought to England aboard a captured French frigate and landed in Portsmouth in February 1802. The stone and other antiquities were presented to George III, who directed that they should be placed in the care of the British Museum. And the Rosetta Stone is currently on display in Gallery 4, where it has been on almost continuous display since it arrived at the British Museum over 200 years ago. In 1793, war broke out between Britain and France and continued for many years. In 1805, the Royal Navy under Nelson won a famous victory over the French Navy at the Battle of Trafalgar. And the French Emperor, Napoleon Bonaparte was finally defeated at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. Before this, in late 1810, George III became seriously ill and he accepted the need for a Regency Act in 1811, whereby the Prince of Wales, his eldest son, acted as regent for the remainder of his father's life. Despite signs of recovery in May 1811, by the end of that year, George was living in permanent seclusion in Windsor Castle. And we see here a portrait of George III towards the end of his reign, holding a hat and cane in his right hand, saber sword in his left, and behind him, we see Windsor Castle. This portrait was taken in 1812 and George was to remain living at Windsor, still king, but with the country ruled by his son as Prince Regent until the end of George III's reign. We're now going to take a 10 minute break before we find out a little bit more about the reign of the Prince Regent and the remaining Hanoverian kings and the final Hanoverian monarch, Queen Victoria. I will see you in 10 minutes, thank you. Hello and welcome back. Let us get our slideshow started again as we move on to the Prince Regent who at this point in his life is ruling as regent for his father, George III, 
who is living in seclusion at Windsor Castle and has been declared unfit to rule as a sovereign in his own right. In 1811, George Augustus Frederick, Prince of Wales, began his nine year tenure as regent and thus became known as the Prince Regent. He became king in 1820 and on his death, he was followed by his brother William, who reigned as William IV. And we see here on the left, George as the Prince of Wales in the Chapel Royal at St. James's Palace, marrying in 1795. He is placing the ring on his future wife's finger and the ceremony is preceded over by this gentleman, the Bishop of London, with George III and Queen Charlotte sitting under a canopy here on the left. Now, George had married Caroline of Brunswick. She was Queen of the United Kingdom and Hanover as the wife of King George IV from 1820 until her death in 1821. She was the Princess of Wales from 1795 to 1820. She and her cousin, were, she and her husband were first cousins. They married, as we see here, in 1795, but separated shortly after the birth of their only child, Princess Charlotte of Wales in 1796. And as part of their formal separation, government discussed an arrangement whereby Caroline would be known by a title such as the Duchess of Cornwall, the Duke of Cornwall being an hereditary title of the Prince of Wales, rather than being known as the Princess of Wales, as was her right since she was married to the Prince of Wales. In January 1820, her father-in-law, King George III, died and her husband became king. So at least nominally, she became queen of the United Kingdom. However, in July 1821, she was barred from the coronation on the orders of her husband. She subsequently fell ill and died three weeks later in Hammersmith, London. She and her husband had a daughter, Princess Charlotte. Princess Charlotte Augusta of Wales, who remained the only child of George, Prince of Wales, and his wife, Caroline of Brunswick. On her birth, on the 7th of January, 1796, she became, Charlotte that is, second in line to the throne. We see her here with her grandfather, George III, who sits holding the baby princess on his knee, feeding her with a spoon, although the contents of the spoon seem to be mostly flowing down the front of her robe. And on his left arm, he's got a coral, a little teething device and some bells, while he himself sits wearing a nightcap. George was very fond of his granddaughter. He had indeed in his own family always preferred his daughters to his sons. And he was very involved in the planning of his granddaughter's education. Who we see here as a toddler with her mother, Caroline of Brunswick. Charlotte herself married Prince Leopold of Saxe-Coburg on the 2nd of May, 1796. However, she died the following year, following the stillbirth of a son the day before. 
Britain went into deep mourning and it is said that draper shops ran out of black cloth. All shops closed for two weeks, as did the Royal Exchange, the law courts and the docks. Charlotte and her son were buried at Windsor Castle. Again, we have a queen who never was. And on her death, George IV had no further legitimate surviving children and therefore no direct heir, no child to become the next king or queen. George IV was very interested in art and architecture. He collected many important paintings and built the Royal Pavilion at Brighton, whilst also renovating Windsor Castle and Buckingham Palace. Now, George was very fond of pageants and parties, and he ran up huge personal debts, which had to be paid off with grants voted to him by Parliament. He made royal visits to different parts of his kingdom, including Hanover, Ireland and Scotland. And in 1829, George agreed to Catholic emancipation, which reduced religious and legal discrimination against Roman Catholics in the United Kingdom. And here we see a cross-sectional drawing of Brighton Pavilion showing the music room, the salon, the banqueting room, and at the far right, the kitchen. And this drawing was made around 1821. And we have above it a more detailed print of the music room at Brighton Pavilion with chandeliers in the form of water lilies, wall paintings in red and gold, showing signs set in the Chinese landscape, Chinese porcelain, including pagoda towers, you can see them here on the right in green, a beautiful blue and gold carpet and an organ on the far wall. And we see here a music party underway with the Prince Regent himself as he was in 18, as he was seated on the left and other members of the court standing around the edge of the room and seated opposite the Prince Regent. When George IV died, having been king for 10 years from 1820 to 1830, with a previous nine years as the Prince Regent, as we've said, he had no children to succeed him. So the throne passed to his brother, William. William was the third son of George III and had served as an officer in the Royal Navy before he became king at the age of 64. And this portrait to the left shows William in 1780, aged about 15, wearing a naval uniform and pointing to the channel, the English channel, on a globe. And in 1827, he was appointed Britain's first Lord High Admiral since the previous Lord High Admiral in 1709. The gold fingering, which you see to the right, decorated with black enamel, shows William as Duke of Clarence, the title he held before he became king. On his coat, he wears the star and ribbon of the garter and the order of the bath. And all this portrait was taken before his ascension to the throne. So 
before 1830, when as brother to the king, he would have been expecting his niece to inherit as Queen Charlotte. And then on her death in childbirth, he himself became heir to the throne. The role of ordinary people in helping to decide government policy grew during William's reign. And in 1832, the King signed the Great Reform Bill, which aimed to improve the way that members of Parliament were elected. New standardised rules were introduced saying who was allowed to vote in parliamentary elections and the right to vote was extended so that more a people able to decide who they wanted as their representative in Parliament. The Slavery Abolition Act of 1833 abolished slavery in parts of the British Empire. This Act of Parliament expanded the jurisdiction of the Slave Trade Act, previously passed in 1807, and made the purchase or ownership of slaves illegal within the British Empire, with the exception, a small exception, the territories in the possession of the East India Company, which at that time included Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, and the island of St Helena. William married the German-born Princess Adelaide, who we see here in a print and a portrait around the time of her marriage, and then as an older lady following the death of her husband, and they, she married William in a double wedding with his brother, Prince Edward, Duke of Kent, who on the same day, the 11th of July, 1818, at Kew Palace in Surrey, was marrying his bride, Victoria. Now the print of Queen Adelaide, produced in 1830, based on a portrait by a miniature painter, Mary Green, who exhibited at the Royal Academy from 1795 to 1805. The miniature portrait of Queen Adelaide, which is today part of the Royal Collection, was probably painted soon after Adelaide's marriage in 1818 to George Duke of Clarence, with the print subsequently widely reproduced and circulated when she became Queen Adelaide, when her husband succeeded to the throne. Her two daughters, Charlotte and Elizabeth, died in infancy, and the throne passed to William's niece, Victoria. And during Victoria's reign, Adelaide lived at Bushy House in Teddington, West London. And this portrait of 1849 shows her as Queen Dowager Adelaide. She was born in 1792, and this portrait shows her in the year of her death, 1849. Now, just below, we have a very intriguing object from the British Museum collection. It is a Wedgwood tea set made from unglazed red stoneware, and there is a teapot, sugar bowl, and a milk jug, each glazed inside, but with no external decoration, apart from the added silver punched plate, openwork silver overlay, and small silver knobs. Now this tea set, was probably made around 1840 to 1845. And it is a style known as the revived Rococo style. 
the two covers carefully worked with silver rosebud knobs. And the pieces have long been associated with Queen Adelaide herself. In 1856, they belonged to a gentleman called Isaac Falk, and they were exhibited by him at the Crystal Palace exhibition. They were mentioned in a publication known as the Art Journal, where they were stated as being amongst the conspicuous objects exhibited in the ceramic court. And the article also alluded to their former royal ownership. However, to date, no trace has been found of this particular tea service in the Royal Archive at Windsor. So although we can say with certainty that it is a style of tea set which would have been very fashionable during the final part of Queen Adelaide's life, at the moment the fact that it was owned by Queen Adelaide is merely supposition and could, I dare say, have been an invention on the part of its later owner to increase its prestige. We see here a picture of Queen Victoria with her mother and her father. And again, to the right, a picture of Queen Victoria as a small child with her mother, published on a magazine cover based on a portrait taken of Victoria in 1821. Now, we've already heard that Victoria's father, Prince Edward of Kent, had married his wife, Victoria, at a double marriage with his brother, George, sorry, William, who was marrying Adelaide. His daughter was christened Alexandria Victoria. However, her father died before she was a year old. And this family portrait published soon after she had become queen, she's shown with her mother and her late father. And the portrait of her with her mother was published on the front of the magazine, the pen and pencil, to celebrate her golden jubilee in 1887. When William IV died in June 1837, his niece Victoria became the Queen of the United Kingdom. Now, since 1714, Britain had shared a monarch with Hanover in Germany. But under the law in Hanover, women were excluded from the Hanoverian succession. And thus, whilst Victoria inherited all British dominions, her father's younger brother, the Duke of Cumberland, became King of Hanover. He was also her heir presumptive before she had her first child. So the fourth son of George III, who hoped or indeed had the right to sit on the British throne. Victoria married her cousin Albert in February 1840, and they had nine children, five daughters and four sons. When Albert died in 1861, Victoria wore mourning for the rest of her life. Victoria's reign was a time of great industrial expansion. And in 1842, Victoria was the first reigning monarch to travel by train. During the second half of her reign, Britain's empire on both the continents of Africa and Asia increased in size. And in 1877, Victoria was declared Empress of India. <laughs> 
Victoria herself was a constitutional monarch. She had little direct power, but was able to influence decisions made by her ministers, especially the prime ministers. And famous prime ministers during her reign included Lord Melbourne, Benjamin Disraeli, and Lord Gladstone. Victoria herself was skilled at drawing and painting and kept a diary describing her family life and royal duties throughout her life. As well as the existing royal palaces, Victoria brought, bought Osborne House on the Isle of Wight as a family home in 1845, and Albert bought Balmoral Castle in Scotland as a family retreat in 1852. Images of Victoria and her family were widely available through newspapers and the growing use of photography. And we have here two photographs of the Queen. The first shows her seated with her family at Osborne House. She is holding her most recent baby, Prince Albert stands leaning on a balcony to the left with the eight remaining children grouped around their parents. And this photograph was taken in 1858. The photograph that we see to the right was taken right at the end of Queen Victoria's reign. Both these photographs are part of the British Museum collection. And this photograph to the right shows the Queen in 1900. Victoria attended her last public function in 1899 and she laid the foundation stone for buildings which were to become the South Kensington Museum. The museum had been established in 1852 with money raised from the Great Exhibition of 1851, and it was later renamed the Victoria and Albert Museum in honour of the Queen and her husband. Victoria died in 1901 and was succeeded by her eldest son, who took the throne as Edward VII. He can be seen standing in the photograph to the left, he was actually christened Albert Edward after his father, but was always known by his royal title of King Edward VII, and never by his family name, Albert or Bertie. Also standing with him are his siblings and before we come to our final slide, I am just going to read you through uh, their names because the list of names given to Victoria's children uh, not only is a, a fascinating insight into how the royal family in a manner that many families nowadays do, tried to remember and incorporate members of the family into the names of their children, often as a second or third name. And also is an interesting insight into some names which continue popular today, others of which seem to have fallen completely out of popularity. So uh, here we go, get your listening ears on. It is quite some collection of names. So her eldest daughter was named Victoria after her mother and was christened Victoria, Adelaide, Mary, Louise. And she was subsequently known as the Princess Royal, as is Princess Anne, being the eldest daughter of the ruling monarch. We then have her brother, Albert Edward, who succeeded his mother and became King Edward VII. The next child, a daughter, Alice Maud Mary. So interesting that by the time we get to the third daughter, uh, they're already reusing one of the middle names from their first daughter. 
followed by a son, Alfred Ernest Albert. So he gets his father's name as his third name. Then a daughter, Helena Augusta, a nod to their Hanoverian heritage, Victoria. So her third name is her mother's name. Another daughter followed, Louise Caroline Alberta. So she gets her father's name in the female form as her third name. We then have Arthur William Patrick Albert, followed by Leopold, that was the name of Albert and Victoria's uncle, Leopold George Duncan Albert. Albert seems to have uh, got his name into quite a few of the names of his children, as did his wife, because the name of their last child, their last daughter, the little baby you can see being held in this photo, is Beatrice Mary Victoria Theodore. Theodore being the name of Victoria's half-sister, the child of her mother's first marriage. So what happens next? Well, Victoria had reigned from 1837 to 1901. And on her death, her son succeeded as Edward VII. He reigned from 1901 to 1910. And his house, his royal house, took the name of his father. So he ruled under the house of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha. So Victoria was technically the last Hanoverian monarch. The Royal House then changed its name in 1917 during World War I. And we are now ruled by monarchs of the House of Windsor, which began with George V, who reigned from 1911 to 1936. And our current queen, Queen Elizabeth II, is a member of the House of Windsor. And the House of Windsor will continue for the foreseeable future under her son, her grandson, and her great-grandson, at which point we will most likely find that we have another King George on the throne. Thank you very much indeed. That is the end of our introduction to the Hanoverian kings and queens. And if you have any questions for me, just pop them into the chat or the Q&A and I will be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. So one of the listeners says, is there, is there any truth to the rumour that George III was married prior to his official marriage to the Queen Charlotte? And also, while you're on that, we, I suppose you might as well talk about George the Fourth's first marriage. Yes, yes. Um, we mentioned, didn't we, right at the end of the talk, that Queen Victoria's mother was in fact a widow uh, when she married Edward, uh, Duke of Kent. Um, and in fact, this issue of first and second marriages does occur at several times during the Hanoverian family history. Uh, let's start with George III. George III is rumoured to have been married while still a prince, before he was king, to a lady called Hannah Lightfoot. And this is very similar to the story that circulated around Charles II, who was supposed to have been married to a lady called Lucy Walters before he then married Catherine of Braganza, who became queen. Now, Hannah Lightfoot is an interesting story because it is most likely just that, a rumour, a rumour which has grown and become more believed in the telling. Hannah Lightfoot was a Quaker, and the reason it seems unlikely that George was ever married to her was firstly, she was a Quaker, she was not a member of the Church of England, and there were very strict rules at the time about 
religions that the monarchs could marry into and the Hanoverians um, as Protestants when they became monarchs of Great Britain then became head of the Church of England and therefore became Anglican Protestants um, and Quakers although they are also Protestants are they sit outside the Church of England officially. In addition she was already married so any marriage that did take place would have been bigamous on her behalf, would not have been a legal marriage. And it seems unlikely behaviour for George III. George III uh, is often spoken of as being quite a stickler for etiquette and was indeed quite shocked at the behaviour of some of his brothers in terms of ladies that they got involved with and ladies that they married who he thought were not appropriate to become members of the royal family. Oh, that's funny, that sounds very familiar. There's nothing new under the sun when it comes to the royal family. Uh, and in fact, he passed the, the, uh, the Marriage Act, which meant that any member of the royal family who wished to get married had to have the permission and the approval of the reigning sovereign. Uh, and that was what came up with Princess Margaret when she wanted to marry Peter Townsend, was it had to be agreed to by her sister as reigning monarch. Uh, so George III had very particular ideas about marriage and who should marry who, uh, and therefore that makes it unlikely that he married Hannah Lightfoot. It was, it was a good story which grew in the telling. Uh, his son, however, George IV, did marry a lady before he married Caroline of Brunswick. He married a lady called Maria Fitzherbert, who was older than him, who had previously been married, was a widow, but most importantly, was a Roman Catholic. Now, this meant that for two reasons, she was never officially recognised as the Prince Regent's wife. Firstly, he did not ask permission of his father, George III, to marry Mrs Fitzherbert, and in all likelihood he did this because he knew it wouldn't be given. And also, there was a rule, there was a, an Act of Parliament which said that a Roman Catholic or the child of a Roman Catholic could not sit on the throne. And this was introduced after James II, who was a Roman Catholic, was deposed and his eldest daughter Mary, who was a Protestant, became queen rather than his son, who was born to his second wife and was baptised a Roman Catholic. So George IV did marry Mrs Fitzherbert uh, and she considered herself to be his wife, but it was never legal. And therefore his legal official wife was what could be termed his second marriage to Caroline of Brunswick, although it was extremely unsuccessful. And as we heard they separated immediately after the birth of their only child. Very good, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. The next question. Um, what was, so on, on a similar topic, what was the religion of the early Hanoverians? Uh, did they uh, undergo any conversion or similar process to become head of the Church of England? I suppose this goes back to that kind of act of succession thing, isn't it, you mentioned earlier, earlier on? Yes, the, the Germany, um, modern Germany, is a country with both um, significant Protestant and Catholic populations. So although we tend to think of Germany as being the seat of the Reformation, Martin Luther and the Diet of Worms and nailing up his ideas on the church door. Um, currently, in modern day Germany, the Protestants are not the leading faith as they are, say, here in the United Kingdom. And the Catholics are not the leading faith in Germany uh, in the same way that, say, they are in France and Belgium. So the Hanoverian electors were Protestant. So they were members of a Protestant faith, a Germanic Protestant faith. When George I became king, he would have to have converted, perhaps is not the correct word, but would have been baptised into the Church of England 
which is also a Protestant faith specific to England, founded by Henry VIII. And in being baptized into the Church of England, he therefore also could act as the head of the Church of England. And then subsequently, all his children would have been baptized into the Church of England. So Protestant, which is one of the reasons he was able to succeed to the throne, uh, and why the young and the old pretender who were Catholic, despite their military interventions, um, never actually managed to garner enough support amongst the British population to reclaim the throne for the Stuarts. Protestant, and then a member of the Church of England, as were all the subsequent monarchs. And the rule, the rule still, still stands today. A Roman Catholic cannot be king or queen although interestingly Charles when he becomes king uh, he says that he wants to be known not as the def defender of the faith the faith being the Church of England um, but defender of faith because he says he recognizes that his subjects nowadays are members of many different world faiths and he is the defender of the faith of all of his subjects not just the faith of himself and those of his subjects in the Church of England. Isn't the defender of the faith, it was, wasn't it conferred on Henry VIII by the Pope, so isn't it a Catholic thing in the first place? Yes, I know this is, this is one of the ironies of Henry VIII, is that early in his reign, Henry VIII, who we see as the founder of the Church of England, uh, the monarch who broke with the Pope, who demoted the Pope to being merely the Bishop of Rome, and um, at the start of his reign, born as a Roman Catholic, obviously, uh, wrote pamphlets in defense of the Roman Catholic faith and in defense of the role of the Pope as head of the Roman Catholic Church, in return for which the Pope was so pleased by the pamphlets that Henry wrote that he gave him the title Defender of the Faith, the faith being the Roman Catholic faith. And Henry uh, held on to this title even after he had broken with the Pope, uh, it remains on the coins of Queen Elizabeth II and is now taken to be defender of the Anglican faith. So yes, it's one of, the, one of those ironies in the reign of Henry VIII where he was very good at saying one thing one minute and something completely different the other minute and thinking both the positions could be held simultaneously. He never actually became a Protestant himself during his reign. He continued to celebrate Catholic Mass until his death. Thank you. Um, so um, has there ever been any moves by the Egyptian government to, to claim back the Rosetta Stone? Ah, now that's a very interesting question. Very interesting indeed. The Rosetta Stone was, how can one say it? It was found by the French the French found it during Napoleon's expedition to Egypt. He hoped to move Egypt under French influence uh, so that he could use it as um, a passage through to Asia um, from the Mediterranean, taking them through uh, to Asia, which meant you didn't have to go around the bottom of Africa. He failed in this when he was defeated by the British and the Turkish, who did not want Egypt to fall under the influence of the French, but the French scholars who went with Napoleon had, by the time of Napoleon's defeat, already uncovered a large number of antiquities, and the Rosetta Stone was found as a foundation stone. It had been reused in the bottom of a military fort near the village of Rosetta, hence its name. Uh, when they were defeated, Everything they'd found was ceded reluctantly to the British. So we sort of nicked it off the French um, and was brought here to Britain. The Egyptian government have asked for a number of their antiquities to be returned, um, particularly antiquities such as the Rust of Stone, which are very unique um, because of the role it played in the translation of the hieroglyphic script and the translation of Middle Egypt, Middle Egyptian, meaning that we could then read all hieroglyphic script across ancient Egyptian objects, uh, means that it has a, a very important role in the history of Egyptology. Um, they haven't asked for everything back, um, 
and there are certain items that we've never had. So lots of people think we've got Tutankhamun. Tutankhamun has never come to Britain. Um, for about the last, well, over a hundred years now, objects that are found in Egypt during excavation, whatever the nationality of the excavating team, the objects remain in Egypt. So Tutankhamun has always remained in Egypt, even though he was uncovered by Howard Carter, who was funded by the British Lord Carnarvon. Um, before that, objects were transferred to other European countries, as with the Rosetta Stone. Uh, sometimes there'd be a half and half division and half the objects would stay in Egypt, half would come to Britain. And amongst these objects, it is usually the most important um, culturally or historically, as with the Parthenon sculptures, that the country currently governing the area where the object was found requests its return, which is the same story with the Benin Clarks, with, with a request from the Nigerian government for those to be returned. But the Rosetta Stone hasn't gone back yet. And as you know, um, although some material has been deaccessioned from the museum collection and returned to modern day communities and countries, uh, the Rosetta Stone, the Benin Clarks and the Parthenon sculptures have not yet. Thank you. Um, so to which monarch are we referring to when we talk about Georgian architecture? Ah, yes, that's that's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I've spent all morning talking about the Hanoverians, which is the name of the dynasty. Uh, in popular history, the period is often known as the Georgian period. You, you will not hear many people talk about Hanoverian England or Hanoverian Britain or Hanoverian architecture. In essence, Georgian goes all the way up from George I roughly through to the Prince Regent. And it refers to a period of architecture based during the 1700s, from 1714 up to around 1800. Um, and you then have a shift in architectural styles. You start under Victoria to have um, a Gothic revival, a medieval revival. The Georgian architecture that we talk about is what is referred to as a neoclassical revival, where during that period of British architectural history, designers were looking back to the ancient world and the buildings often have what to our eye might look like a, an ancient Greek facade. The British Museum is an example of that. It's a neoclassical building. So Georgian architecture is neoclassical architecture and really it only runs up to 1800, possibly not even that because at that point you then get an introduction, as we have with uh, Brighton Pavilion, of examples from overseas like Shinozari and which is based on Chinese architecture. There's a lot of influence from the Indian architecture. Uh, and then it goes into Gothic and medieval revival. So George the first through to the end of George the third would be a key period for Georgian stroke neoclassical architecture, of which there is a lot in London. Thank you. And so, uh, where did the king and his family live when he purchased Buckingham Palace House? So, so where? Ah, uh, the the um, the royal family had always had occupation of Windsor Castle, and there were a number of royal palaces in London. So, St James's Palace down at Westminster was part or associated with the old Palace of Westminster. Uh, which is where the Tudor court was based. Um, there'd been a huge fire in Westminster and a lot of that Tudor palace was destroyed, um, after which the royal court was centred more around St James's palace. Um, you've also got Clar Clarence House um, and the royal family then subsequently bought into their property portfolio a number of other places that already existed. So the royal family bought Buckingham House, which had belonged to the Dukes of Buckingham, 
they bought that it's a family house and at that time it stood outside central London was away from Westminster was away from the smell of the River Thames um, not quite a country retreat but certainly suburban um, so they had Windsor had always belonged to the royal family they had always had apartments in Westminster they obviously had apartments out at Hampton Court which had passed into royal ownership from Cardinal Wolsey to Henry VIII so the royal family were quite peripatetic um, and then Buckingham Palace represents an addition to that portfolio which nowadays to our mind is where the Queen lives but back in Georgian times would not have been seen as their main residence it developed as that over time. Thank you. Um, if there's no more questions, I think that brings our workshop to the end today. Let me say thank you to Catherine. That was absolutely brilliant. I, I really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. And thank you for everyone, to everyone else. Um, thank you. It's, it's been, been lovely to uh, introduce you to the Hanoverians. And I look forward to seeing you again next week for South America. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.